Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to our second Polar Tech webinar um, that relates to uh, this cohort of teachers. We're really excited to um, connect with you guys again. It's been a long time. I can't believe uh, how fast um, spring and summer has progressed, and we're in Alaska. We're almost headed into fall, so it's, it's uh, crazy. How, how fast the time goes. But today's webinar is um, about getting ready uh, for your field expedition that's coming up and helping you um, kind of reorient your mind since uh, you were here in Fairbanks um, oh so long ago. Um, we have uh, a lot of Antarctica expeditions this year, and uh, some of them I think actually Justin is one of the first ones to go out this field season. So. Um, and with school and everything coming up, it, uh, it comes up fast, and all of a sudden you guys are out in the field. So we're glad that you had a moment to join us today. And um, like I said, we have um, um, the U.S. Antarctica Program representative, Elaine Hood, on here today, so we'll be able to answer some of your questions. So a few things um, about the agenda, what we've got going on. Um, we'll just go around Robin virtually and introduce everybody. Um, and uh, tell us where you're going. Mostly this is just a um, familiar, free familiar yourself with each other as well as we have an alumni um, presenting today. And like I said, we have Elaine also from the U.S. Antarctica program. So I will actually start with Elaine. Um, Elaine, you want to say hi and um, tell us your role with, uh, with the U.S. Okay. Antarctica program. Sure. So I'm Elaine Hood, and I was not able to come up to Fairbanks this year to meet all of you, unfortunately. I work for the Lockheed Martin Antarctic Support Contract in Denver, Colorado. I began with the U.S. Antarctic Pro Program back in 1998, back when another contractor was in charge, and then through the last 15 years, it was Raytheon, and now it is Lockheed Martin. I work very closely with the National Science Foundation on a daily basis. I do communications, education outreach, uh, public relations, the media, things like that. We have the Antarctic Sun newspaper and the Antarctic Photo Library on www.usap.gov that we manage. And I also was a teacher for 20 years before I left teaching and went to Antarctica. So I've been doing this for the last 15 years. And when you are sending in your medical PQ paperwork, it's going to the University of Texas Medical Branch, which is one of our teammates. And I can answer your questions or I can find the answers to your questions. So I can help in that aspect. I plan to be in McMurdo this season in October and November, leaving the first part of December this year. So that's it for me. Okay, thanks. Okay, and um, Glenn, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, I'm uh, Glenn Clark. I'm going to be going to Sultan Glacier with uh, Amy Levetner's crew on the Palmer. We're going to be the last of the last going out. It's been a hurry up and wait. Okay, okay great. Um, and uh, Yamini. Hi, I'm Yamini Bala. I'm from Chicago, and I'm going to be going to Waste Divide with um, Aaron Pettit and Rachel Auburn from Dartmouth. And that's going to be at the start of December. Okay, and uh, Nell? I am Nell Herman. Um, I have been teaching in State College, Pennsylvania for the last, gosh, 11 years, but I'm moving this fall up to a teaching position in coastal Maine, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I went to Palmer Station, Antarctica, in 2012 for about five weeks and I worked with some folks from the University of Alabama at Birmingham on an ocean acidification study which was really really great. All right and thanks for joining us Nell and Elaine. Um, okay let me see um, and then Sarah do you want to say hi since you're out there in the world? 
Hello, it's Sarah. I'm down here in Denali working um, in the summertime here, and it's really good to hear your voices. Yeah, it is. Um, nice day to have everybody back again. Okay, so um, the, real quickly, we'll go over um, Blackboard's features, which I had that slide up for just a little bit. Um, we'll talk about what we're going to do with the, uh, in the webinar, and then um, who does what, go over um, various um, recommendations, and then uh, talk about the education outreach planning and where you guys are on that and have lots of time for questions. So um, if you've joined us by Blackboard Collaborate, um, you can see the slide here. If you, since we're such a small group, you can um, just type in the chat box if you want to ask a question or just click on the hand or I think Yamini is the only one that's joined by voice over IP. The rest of us can just talk away all we want to. <laughs> we just have to unmute. Um, and we will archive this um, webinar and put it on the, um, send you a link to it so that if you miss something or you want to refresh your memory, you can, you can uh, check it out later. So, um, Sarah, I'll let you change slides since I got lost. Um, okay. I'm reading her message. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, Again, the purpose of this webinar is to help you refocus on the expedition, including the logistics. And then we also want to give you some ideas about how you might engage your students and the public before, during, and after the expedition. And that's why we've uh, invited now. And then hopefully Mike LeBaron will be on later. If not, we'll share slides um, that he sent us. Um, so moving on. All right, um, so here's the timeline of what we've got going on. Uh, you can see that, uh, that you guys are somewhere in the middle of the August-September area. Um, one thing that uh, is coming up, if you haven't already done it, we just a reminder to the current teachers, it's the evaluation. Um, the, uh, the evaluation piece is that we'll need you, as uh, soon as you start school, to administer a pre-survey to your students and uh, complete the uh, classroom information survey. And we'll send out an email about that, but just a reminder that that's coming up. Um, and then, uh, of course, you guys are really the biggest uh, task that you have on hand right now is um, getting ready for that pre-deployment and going through the medical process. So um, just a reminder of who does what again. Um, we have Elaine, who's our POC, our point of contact. Maybe that's still an acronym we used. I don't know. <laughs> um, for the US Antarctica program. And um, she, she gave a nice intro about her role. But um, I think the big thing that you need to know is that that's who's doing all the logistic work and getting you to and from Antarctica. And that's also who will be providing you your cold weather gear um, from Christchurch or if you're going by ship through Punta Arenas and getting you the supplies that you need um, to go to um, Antarctica. Um, as far as our role, just a reminder, we at ARCUS and our, our grant will be reimbursing you for substitute costs. Um, any medical expenses that aren't covered by your insurance, we cover the lodging to and from um, Christchurch or in Chile, um, just getting to and from Antarctica there because um, that's not covered by the U.S. Antarctica program and just kind of miscellaneous costs that um, don't get picked up by research teams or through the um, U.S. Antarctica program. Um, your researchers just have you on their SIP and for the most part are not paying for everything. There's a few exceptions to that, um, such as like Brian. Um, he is actually written into his um, researcher's um, research plan, so his logistics are covered under that plan. Anyway, and then your role is to uh, get PQ'd, make sure all your travel and paperwork are complete, that you're um, set to, um, you know, go down to Antarctica. Um, 
this is an old slide, and I'm sure we'll have Elaine talk more about this, but the U.S. Antarctica program does put out a very comprehensive participant guide. Um, this is the old cover. They just issued a new one, and I'll let Elaine uh, kind of pipe in here as to what we find in that guide and where it's located. So the U.S. Antarctic Participant Guide is located on our main website, which is www.usap.gov. Hopefully you've all been there. And on the left-hand bar, there's you navigate, you can find a link called Travel and Deployment. And the brand new recent issue was just posted online about an hour ago. So it has all the current information. It tells you what to pack, how to pack, gives you postal addresses. It tells you specifically what it's going to be like living at McMurdo or living on board the Nathaniel B. Palmer. It gives you information about Internet connectivity, do's and don'ts, things like that, and any questions that it doesn't cover, feel free to contact me for more specific information about where you're going. Okay, great. And uh, that's one of the things that um, uh, we do put, we did put um, the link on the teacher's manual on the Polar Trek website and uh, the two links just went up also in the chat area as to how to access access that guide and Sarah said she sent it out as well. So um, I was looking at it this morning as a refresher for myself. It is really comprehensive. There's a lot of information in there and some of it's more relevant to you than others but um, it definitely covers a lot of things. So some of the things that we wanted to remind you through this logistics um, phone call are just kind of the pre-field reminders. Um, again, all the travel is going to be made through uh, the U.S. Antarctica program contractor, and I don't remember the acronym you have for your travel people. Sorry, Elaine. Um, but that it will start working on your travel um, at some point after all your uh, paperwork for the medical process has been um, Process. And actually, I'll have Elaine talk more about the timeline here and how things all go together. Um, another thing you can remember um, is that as you go through this whole process, that there, you are allowed some personal time after the expedition. And I just looked in the handbook, um, that's still allowable. Um, so if you wanted to spend some time in New Zealand or go somewhere else um, after your expedition, um, that is allowed, and we can talk to you about that in more depth during your pre-field call or any time. Um, again, substitute costs. Tell your schools, especially as you go into the school year, if you haven't started already and you're reminding them that you're going to Antarctica, that, that substitute costs are going to be reimbursed after your expedition is complete. And it's real simple. They just send a, let, a note, on an invoice on school letterhead to Arcus, and we send a check. It's that easy. Um, also, all that other stuff, um, medical insurance, travel insurance, all that stuff, um, we will pay that by ARCUS. Um, I, you do not necessarily have to wait for medical costs to be reimbursed after your expedition. You can send us invoices beforehand. And we do have the ability to issue a travel advance if you need it. And then um, when we get to outreach, we'll talk more about the ECW kits, but you can check those out. Um, we have four kits available for checkout, and you can use those for any of your um, uh, pre-field um, outreach activities. Um, is there anything you want to add to that real quick? And then I may turn it over to Elaine here. No, that's fine. So I. I just to reiterate to I think it's really important to know that if you need that travel advance that we can do that for you, but we need a little bit of time to get that organized. So if it's just, you know, a week before your expedition you realize you need a travel advance, like maybe give it two or three weeks if you've thought it through and say, okay, that would be helpful, then we can get that processed and get the get the check to you ahead of time. Okay, and uh, before we go into uh, Nell's and Mike's um, tips for success and things, um, Elaine, if you don't mind, can you tell them a little bit or remind uh, everybody of kind of what the, the process is for um, getting qualified and, you know, what the strategy is this year for uh, sending in paperwork and how that all works and how it uh, in turn turns the travel requests out and all that kind of stuff? 
Okay, so the physical and dental qualification part we call PQing, and the University of Texas Medical Branch, UTMB in Galveston, Texas, is the medical reviewing office. So when you go to your local dentist and your doctors and you get all that paperwork done, your physical exams done, we are recommending that you hang on to all of your paperwork and once you have completed all or 90% of your paperwork, throw it in a FedEx envelope or a registered mail envelope and send it to the address at UTMB that you've been provided so that all the paperwork arrives at one time. Because they have thousands and like maybe 12,000 individuals that they're trying to process paperwork for, of which only 3,000 people actually go to Antarctica, but we also hire people who are alternates in case somebody can't go at the last minute as an employee to go to Antarctica. So they have thousands of people that they're processing and indeed sometimes paperwork does get lost. So I recommend that if you can mail it all at one time, it's less likely to get lost in the shuffle. Then when they receive it, they enter it into a database and they'll just, you know, say, okay, dental paperwork received on August 20th. You know, medical paperwork received on August 20th. And then that spreadsheet actually shows up on in my office here in Denver, Colorado, and I can see that they have received the paperwork. If you, if you need to have some dental work done or something like that, that type of information is not available to me because that's private information. But what I can see is that they have requested additional medical paperwork or additional tests for you. So there's that aspect, the dental and physical paperwork, and then there's also additional papers that just simply have to be signed showing that you acknowledge that you understand you're going to a harsh continent. And all of that paperwork has to be sent to UTMB and received before you are deployment qualified, which we call DQ'd. And again, this very huge spreadsheet um, should have all the information, the dates of when that this various paperwork has been received for all of you. And I just had looked online yesterday, and as of yesterday, it indicated that none of you have turned in, sent in your paperwork yet. So I'm hoping that you are in the process of going to the doctor and dentist, but that you're just hanging on to your paperwork and haven't sent it in yet. Also, please make a photocopy of everything that you send. And I would recommend FedExing it or somehow tracking it so that you have acknowledgement that they have received it. Just in case, you know, they call and say, well, we never received this. Well, you say, well, I sent it on this date and you did receive it and I do happen to have a photocopy of it so I could send a new photocopy. That's really highly recommended. It is your responsibility to stay on top of this and I uh, make sure that they have received everything that they need. And then once you have been deemed deployment qualified or DQ'd, then a little button is toggled and that means that our travel division now has permission to book an airplane ticket for you. And they try to book those at least three weeks in advance and it will be an electronic ticket and they will telephone you and talk to you on the phone and and make sure that you're leaving out of the airport that you want and at a time that's convenient for you. And Janet, did you want me to stop at this point or did you want me to walk through the flight down to Christchurch? Um well let's see what uh let's um, do yeah, medical questions maybe. That would be good. Okay. Yeah, because I think yeah, Minnie and uh, Glenn both have questions, and then Nell, you can pipe in anything that you experienced uh, along the way here. So, uh, Glenn, go ahead, since you can't uh, see what's happening on the screen. Um, do you have any questions that you want to ask Elaine right now? Sure. Uh, my doctor just said do only checked 
items, or do I have to do other things? She noticed uh, because I'm over uh, 50, so I need a stress test, but it's not hasn't been checked. So she just wanted to clarify that before I go back tomorrow. Oh, interesting. So you got a checklist, but the stress test, which normally is required for people over age 50, in your case, it was not checked. Yeah, that's what, that's what she was wondering, and I'm like, I don't know. Um, so we've done most of the things. We're just going to do some more the blood work tomorrow. But she asked me about that, and then she asked if we are a walking uh, blood bank. Those are the two questions from my doctor. Well. Yes, we are. Okay. Um, you're going to be on the ship, which is a whole different ball of wax than being at the normal station. But we do operate under a mode that everybody is expected to be a walking blood bank volunteer if possible. All right, thanks. So in uh, terms of that stress test that has not been X, to you... Well, that's very unusual, and of course I'm not a medical person, so I don't know why it wouldn't have been X. And you are over age 50, so let me, um, I've just written myself a note, and I will follow up with an email to you and the right people, and we'll, we'll get an answer for you, okay? Okay, so in the meantime, I'll just go ahead with anything that is checked. Yeah, we just do what's on the checklist for right now, and you don't leave until – we've got some time with you. You don't leave until January. So if they do say, oh, yes, you need it, and they come back next week with that, then I guess you'll have to go back in. But I'll see if I can get an answer as soon as possible for you. Okay, that's all I had. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Did we lose somebody, or did somebody join? This is phone? Mike LeBaron. Oh, hi, Mike. I'm okay. sorry, I, I was thinking it was at five. <laughs> That's okay, no worries. Uh, so we have, uh, um, just so you know, because you aren't online yet or uh, through the uh, Blackboard Collaborate, we have Elaine Hood from the U.S. Antarctica Program. We have Nell Herman, a uh, Polar Trek alumni. We have uh, Yamini Bala, a teacher going um, to Antarctica, and Glenn, who is just asking questions, also going to Antarctica. So, and Sarah is online, and Nell is saying, hi, Mike, with lots of smiley faces. <laughs> hi, Nell. <laughs> uh, so uh, where we are, Mike, is we're just kind of going through uh, pre-field things, and um, we'll get to yours and Nell's um, presentations in just a little bit. Um, I was going to turn it over to Yamini. Uh, do you have uh, what's your questions? Um, my question was that I had emailed earlier about um, getting the paperwork with my name spelled wrong on it, and um, Elaine, you had said that you would follow up to get that corrected. But I wasn't wondering. I, I was wondering if that, um, if I just continue to go ahead getting my paperwork filled out as it was sent to me, or if I need to um, wait until that mistake is corrected or anything. Okay, so as soon as I saw your email, I shot a blast out to everybody I could think of, and this includes the people booking airplane tickets, the people at UTMB in Galveston, Texas for medical, uh, the people doing all these online databases, and they all reported back to me that your name was spelled correctly. So I don't know. None of them confess to being the culprit of issuing something with your name incorrect. So I, you received an e. Where is your name misspelled? Like you said, it's on paperwork. Um, in the email that I got, the um, the title of the spreadsheet that was attached to. Um, my email, um, which had the checklist, had my name spelled wrong, both in the document title as well as in the actual document. And that came from UTMB Medical, correct? I mean, it, w it was about your medical checklist, um, correct? I believe so. Okay. Yes. Um, so. Yeah, but Go ahead and keep filling things out. The, the most critical here is when we book your airplane ticket. 
that your airplane ticket okay. is spelled correctly and matches your passport. That's the most critical thing. And I will go back okay. to the UTMB medical person who claims it's spelled correctly, but maybe, I don't know, um, I'll just recommend that they double check one more time. And as I said, now, if you get okay. another communication from anybody with it misspelled, you let me know and I will keep hounding them because somebody wouldn't be following through as they claim they are. So don't feel that you're okay. nagging me. Just keep doing it until we get it fixed. Elaine, okay. Sarah, do you Thank want you. me to resend that email so that you, you do have that document again or you were just asking? Um, yeah, why don't you? I'm not sure if I kept it or not. You got it. Okay. Uh, the other question I have related to that is the SIP. Is it right in the SIP? And I asked our uh, planners, and they said, yes, it is correct in the SIP, because that's where I thought perhaps it had started okay. in it correctly, yeah. but they said it was correct. So. Okay. Everybody claims that it's correct in their database. <laughs> Nobody's confessing to being the culprit here, but we'll see if we can get it fixed. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, those are the two teachers that are on. Um, now, or Mike, is there anything um, you want to add about the, um, we're kind of covering the medical and getting PQ'd and DQ'd and all that kind of stuff. Is there any advice you want to add to this piece? Uh, nothing in particular. It sounds like everybody's keeping up with it. The main thing that I ran into was that mine simply got lost and it had been there for two months and <clears throat> I never got any response from them. And I finally found it in the uh, Windfly file. Good to know. Uh, and this is a this is a good <laughs> This is the point why we want to make sure that everybody keeps a photocopy of what they have and tries to stay on top of it. So, for example, when you guys send your completed paperwork off to UTMB in Galveston, Texas, if you would think to shoot us an email, what I can do then is uh, make a point of checking the database that I have access to like a week later. That should give them time to enter into the spreadsheet that they have received it. And it would be a red flag to all of us if it's not entered in by a week's time and that would alert us that maybe we need to follow up with a phone call to them. So I think that might be best how to handle the potential of lost paperwork. As, as we said, that they, they do have about 12,000 people's paperwork coming in and it can be a nightmare for them. They're trying to go more and more to a paperless process, but we're not quite there yet. I knew, there, were two things. Knew, there were two things. When you say, oh, go ahead now. Oh, go ahead now. <laughs> Uh, uh, when sorry, uh, Elaine, when you say shoot us an email, um, do you mean you an email or somebody else or? Well, if they have my email, that's great. Shoot it to me. But if they don't remember who I am and they shoot it to you guys and then you send it to me, it, somehow get it to me so I can stay on top of it. Okay, perfect. And then the other thing I had a question about earlier, and I don't know um, how important it is. Do, uh, do the teachers, as they're filling out paperwork, need to know their event number? And if so, how do they get that? Um, they should. They don't know their event numbers yet. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, most I, likely they don't, because I usually don't get them. So it's nearly the Sarah. So um, oh, I yeah, we don't. We never. Have a lot, you know, we can't get into the SIPs or anything, so we have no idea what the event numbers are. <laughs> I, I, I can help with that. So I will send event numbers to you, Janet and Sarah, and then you can do with them. Okay? Yeah. 
And uh, sometimes, like I said, sometimes teachers know it because they've been in communications with their research team and they have it. And we, we're the clueless ones, but uh, it's good for us to know. Sure. Okay. So um, Nell says she doesn't have anything to relay. Um, I'm going to uh, say, I'm going to relay what Nell wrote for Glenn's sake because he can't see the text going on. Um, Nell says, I don't have anything really specific to add except to reiterate to get this all squared away in plenty of time. I am a healthy per person but ended up having to have some follow-up appointments which prolonged the process. Good advice. And that is excellent advice because all of us think that we're healthy and when, when UTMB says they need to have more tests done, it's difficult sometimes to get back into the doctor and make another appointment and this can take months so do not delay with making these initial appointments. Okay and it sounds like Yemeni and Glenn at least are um, underway in the process and I think we've had some correspondence with Obed that shows that he's also doing some work so it might be just Brian and um, Brian and Justin that we need to touch base with as far as where they are in the PQ process. So, okay, so that was um, medical getting ready to be deployed. Um, does anyone, uh, Yamini or Glenn, do you have questions about um, the next piece, like what it will be like when you're at Antarctica or I guess Glenn leaving out of Chile, any questions there? I mean, we will go over that with your, in your pre-field call, like, um, more about what kind of things to pack and flights and all that kind of stuff, but do you have any questions for Elaine about the, the process right now, the travel um, process or getting to Antarctica? Sure. Um, speaking of Amy Lavender, she's the head researcher, she said we're actually going through Tasmania. Oh, that's right. So uh, I've been in contact with her and I'm going to be meeting with her again in uh, all. And um, she's been she's really helped me out with that. So, so I, I guess we're different because we're going through Tasmania, but uh, to, to uh, Australia first. Okay. And uh, Glenn, just so you know, every once in a while you kind of cut out. You come in loud, and then you go away. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, did you? I, I said we are basically going out of Tasmania. Um, so I've been in contact regularly with uh, Amy Leventner, and she's keeping me updated on that. Okay, great. Um, so Yamini um, is curious about uh, flying out of uh, Christchurch and where you kind of cut, uh, stopped Elaine, so maybe go into that piece for her. Okay. And Glenn, if you're flying into Australia, some of this will pertain to you too. Um, we buy our tickets through we have to we have restrictions for federal government restrictions on which airlines we can buy tickets through and so the way we usually route people is you will fly to Los Angeles International Airport the evening flight leaves there around 10:30 in the evening and you will cross the international date line and we are routing everybody through Sydney Australia at this time and because you cross the international date line, you will lose a day as you fly west across the Pacific. So let's just pretend that um, let's pretend that Yemeni is leaving the United States on December 1st, and she would fly from her home to LA, get on the LAX flight overnight that evening. December 2nd would not exist for her. She would arrive on December 3rd in Sydney. She has a very short connection. Usually it's less than one hour to connect to the next flight that would then take her from Sydney, Australia to Christchurch, New Zealand. So she would arrive in Christchurch about noon or early afternoon, maybe one o'clock in the afternoon on the 3rd of December. She will be met at the airport by one of our employees who will give her information about what, where, she, how to get to her hotel and what time to report back to the next day for cold weather clothing issue, the ECW issue. 
And then on, so then she'd have the rest of that day free. And then on the 4th in the morning, she likely would report back to the airport to the clothing distribution center, try on all of her ECW gear, and then have the rest of that day free and be informed at what time to report to the airport the morning of her ICE flight. We call it her ICE date. And in this case, my example is saying that her ICE date is December 5th. I don't really know what day it is. And frequently you have to be at the airport at maybe 5 in the morning or something like that. And so you would be there and you, then you would dress in your ECW at the airport to get on board the C-17 or the LC-130 airplane that you would be flying to McMurdo. You are going, you probably are going down the first week of December, which means you will be on an LC-130 ski equipped airplane, which is a slow flight of about eight hours from Christchurch, New Zealand to McMurdo Station. And it's not very comfortable. <laughs> But the good thing is is that you can get up and walk around and there's some windows you can look out of. So that's kind of nice. And then you usually arrive at McMurdo mid-afternoon and you're met by a bus or a van that will take you from the airport into town for a little bit of an orientation. Now, Glenn, when you're flying, you're going to have something similar where you're going to fly out of LAX to Sydney and then on to Tasmania. Um, so your schedule will be somewhat similar where, of course, you're crossing the international date line and allowing a little bit of time for clothing issue and then getting on board the research vessel. Okay. That's good. Does that... Um Sounds like uh, things are just crazy jam packed. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon, Obed Fuka reporting. Sorry for the timing, guys. How are you? Oh, welcome, Obed. This is Janet, and uh, hey, Janet, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, so, just so you know, who's online? Sarah's calling in from Denali, and we have alumni okay. Mike LeBaron, who is also joining us today. Uh, the lady just speaking was Elaine Hood. She's the U.S. Antarctica program, um, our point of contact, and uh, works with them. We have alumni Nell Herman, who's also with us. We have Glenn by phone, and we have Yamini also um, online as well. All right. Hi, guys. Hi. So um, Mike has a comment or a question or something. So Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the that, that travel uh, that Elaine talked about. When you get to the airport, it's a good idea to swap some uh, U.S. money for some uh, New Zealand dollars because you'll be doing things like paying for super shuttle to get from the airport to the hotels back and forth a couple of times. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was or $15, I think, one way. Uh, there's some things like that that are really handy to have some local currency for. The other thing is that I, I guess I didn't really realize until I got there was that there are a number of different hotels they use, and you may not end up necessarily in the same one with the rest of your team or some of the other people that you might be traveling with. So don't be surprised at that. It's not a big deal, but it still does happen. Those are excellent points. Mike, and yes, there's. it depends on the number of people coming down at one time. The first few weeks of October is when we deploy our largest number of people, about a thousand people in the first three weeks, and so we overwhelm the Christchurch hotels, and so we do spread out over a number of different hotels. So you are correct. They, you may not end up in the same hotel as somebody you've met along the way. and. To reiterate your cash point, excellent point, do bring a credit card and do bring a debit card. South Pole Obed is cashless, almost cashless, So, um, and McMurdo, they, they accept credit cards at the station stores, things like that. 
And same thing in New Zealand, of course. You can use your credit card easily, your debit card easily. The Christchurch Airport has ATM machines and do make a point of getting to an ATM machine and getting some cash to get you through the next couple days while you're in New Zealand. It's definitely a good thing to think about. Yeah. Question. Well, a store at the South Pole, do they take credit cards or just cash? Um, South Pole store takes cash at the moment. Oh, okay. Because the South Pole does not have satellite connectivity 24 hours a day, they cannot take credit cards all the time. Because to to operate a credit card machine, you need to have internet connectivity. So um, McMurdo store takes credit card and cash. South Pole. You definitely need cash, and that's, of course, American money at the South Pole and McMurdo. Okay, cash only, no refunds, no exchanges, no? <laughs> oh, well, they probably will do refunds and exchanges, yes. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I have a question, though. Um, okay, go ahead, Obed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, regarding uh, uh, visas to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, do I'm a I'm a, a U.S. resident. I'm Dominican by birth, and I'm a, I'm, I haven't inquired, but if, if you knew, do I have to secure visas for uh, Australia and New Zealand as well for my traveling? Okay, so that's an excellent that? question. Now, U.S. citizens do not need a visa for uh, transiting through New Zealand unless you're staying for a long period of time. But Australia, the time period that we, you are staying over just connecting on a flight, you, you're you not leaving the airport when you're traveling okay. down there. Now, if you're going to go there as a tourist afterwards, then yes, you're going to need to okay. do a visa. And you can do an Australian visa on the internet. I actually got one last year that way. I just w went to the website and paid with a credit card and got a visa. Oh, wonderful. A tourist visa, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but because you are a citizen of the Dominican Republic, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. You'll have to check into everything. Okay. I'll double check with their uh, consulate online. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, this is Janet. Um, just real quickly, um, well, this is all good conversation stuff. I, oh, but I just wanted to relay to you that um, a, a lot of the stuff about traveling and even visa stuff too is also in the U.S. Um, the new U.S. Antarctica participant guide. So when you guys talk about questions about cash and all that kind of thing, um, you can look there. I will tell you one thing that um, we're discovering as you travel around the world more and more and more teachers are going to different places, that if you have time, you should check with your credit card companies to make sure that your credit card has a chip in it. Um, New Zealand, I don't know if they've changed, but Australia ha has some places where they require chip and some they don't. So. Uh, um, you just might want to check up on that. Um, also, we'll go into more details too about the specifics about um, your visas and all that kind of stuff in the pre-field as well. And Elaine will be invited to all of those as well, and so so we can ask her more details about that. Um, Let me just interrupt and just say one more thing about the credit card that you just brought to mind is. I have heard of some of our employees when they did not notify their credit card company that they were going to be out of country and they used their credit card out of country, the credit card company then thought it was stolen and they shut it off. So it's smart for you to maybe alert your credit card company that you will be on international travel so they don't turn it off. Yeah, totally, totally. And and I know in particular with the chip thing and sometimes with depending on your companies, you have to let them know 
um, fairly far in advance. Some people do it online. Sometimes you have to write a letter. Sometimes you have to call an 800 number and stuff. So it's best to start looking into some of that earlier. Uh, the other thing we haven't really talked a lot about, but we will in your pre-field, is travel insurance. Um, usually that comes up as a question, traveler insurance. And we can help you out with that as well and reimburse you um, if you have to pay out of pocket for that. Um, um, I, well, we let's see. Sarah had a question. She wanted a clarification on something you said earlier, Elaine. So I'm going to have um, her uh, come online and ask that question. Yeah, Elaine, this is Sarah. Um, I was trying to jot down what you were saying about the process for when you are in Christchurch, and I think you said that you you might visit the. Um, extreme cold weather gear space on the first day and the second day, or was it just the second day? Okay, yes. Sorry if I was confusing. The day you arrive in Christchurch, you will be met at the airport by one of our employees who will give you information. It's usually a piece of paper printed out with what time you should return the next day to receive your extreme cold weather clothing. And then you are free the rest of that arrival day. And then you would come back the next morning to the clothing distribution center at the time designated to receive your ECW clothing. So you only have to report there one time for the clothing. Is that still All right, thing? perfect. No, that makes much more sense. Thank you so much. And um, just want to recognize that we have gone about an hour. We did start pretty late, uh, but I think we have Yamini for, sorry, Yamini for um, like 15 more minutes or so and maybe a half an hour. So just want to keep people uh, aware of that. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, this is Obed. Go ahead, Obed. Yeah, uh, regarding, uh, all right, uh, I'm a little concerned with, uh, for example, because when I travel, my deployment date is January 8th to January 25th, and uh, I'm going to be living in New York uh, in the dead of the winter, and I understand I'm going to land in New Zealand in the summer. It's, I expect, expect to be hot and whatnot, and uh, once I get my ECW, then I'm going to jump on the cargo planes and then land in the frozen continent. So I'm a little concerned <laughs> about any advice on how to avoid getting like a cold or something? How do I keep my wet, my my body temperature adapted? Any advice on that? Um, you are correct. You're going to be going through weather extremes, but honestly, yeah. your most uh, susceptible time is probably going to be on the international flight, inhaling and breathing recycled air with 500 other passengers on that airplane. I don't think your body will have that much difficulty adjusting back and forth to the different temperatures, but okay. you are likely, very likely to get sick just simply from the airplane travel. So we always advise people to drink tons of water, drink, 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 drink constantly, hydration, okay. hydration. and on the airplane, I, you know, if, if you've done international flights, you are well aware that it's, you get very dehydrated on a flight, and in the middle of the night, you'll wake up uh, as you're flying and be just very, very thirsty, and so we all try to take water with us on the airplane in addition to what the flight attendants provide for us. And then, of course, washing your hands diligently, and um, you know that honestly is the best thing. It's the hot and cold extremes aren't going to be that difficult, but we do find people will get sick simply from the flying aspect of it. So try to you know drink lots of water. That's always my advice. If you and keep you know your nostrils, uh, keep them moist. Sometimes I put like Vaseline inside my nostrils to try to keep them moist so they don't dry and crack because you're going to the South Pole which is also an extremely dry desert and you will 
have to be staying, you know, take chapstick and uh, lotions and things to, to keep moist. Hydrate the, hydrate the skin as well, I guess. Yes. All right, wonderful. I did two of our 12 hour flights from New York to Turkey, and so I, I kind of like. Edit. Yes. So one more question. Flying time, uh, I suspect, was it 18 hour plus of flying? Um, well, you'll go to Sydney, and that's a 12-hour flight from Los Angeles to Sydney. is 12 to 14 hours. It might be 14 hours. And then a one-hour layover in Sydney, and then a three-and-a-half-hour flight to Christchurch. So by the time you've left your home and the time you finish flying, it'll be more than 24 hours of flying. I And I, you know, I know that our time here is short and that Yamini has to leave, so we can encourage any questions from her, and I can stay on the phone for a longer period of time. But I also want everybody to know that they can call me individually and contact me with specific questions about their deployment with no hesitation. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Can we, can we have actually your phone number or email? Is that... Yeah, we'll send it. We'll send it out to you afterwards. Awesome. Thank you. That's wonderful. All right. Great. Thanks. Uh, good questions. And um, yeah, thanks for offering your phone number and email. We'll make sure everybody gets it. Um, okay. Let us move on. Um, well, I guess, um, like you said, Yamini does have a time constraint. So, Yamini, do you have any more questions related to um, the logistics before we kind of we're going to shift gears and talk? Um, hear from Nell and Mike about tips for success and kind of going into some education outreach things. So do you have questions about logistics? He's typing. Not right now. Okay. Perfect. Well, let's move on to uh, Nell and uh, Mike's slides. Um, let's see. Okay. So um, we have two alumni with us today. And Mike, you didn't get to um, introduce yourself. Let me see. Um, are your slides? Who's? Yeah, your slides. Sorry, your slides are first up. So um, I'll let you uh, let you go ahead and just cue me when I need to change slides. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Mike LeBaron. I was on the Wizard Project last year, uh, basically November and December of 2012. I was in Murdo only. I did not end up in the field, which was kind of sad because I was really hoping to because our project was actually, uh, the part I was on was the logistical setup and testing, which was done near McMurdo because of the amount of equipment and the facilities that McMurdo provided. And then after the first of the year, the, uh, the project team traversed out about 600 miles from McMurdo, roughly halfway to the South Pole along the traverse route and set up for the actual, in this case, drilling and testing of a subglacial lake. Uh, so that's what I was doing. So I did spend most of my time in McMurdo. So uh, I did talk with a lot of people who were doing uh, field support or field projects, both in Polar Trek and other projects. So I uh, <clears throat> wish I'd been there, but it didn't happen that way. So anyway, if you want to go ahead, to, I think my slide is next. These are the, the things that I found were the most useful when I got there. Um, kind of, I guess I'd say an overarching uh, preface to this is that talk a lot to your PI, to your principal investigator. They're all different. They all have a different way of, of approaching things. Uh, I'm going to say right up front, I didn't get a whole lot of input before I went down there as to re totally what to expect, but I found that probably didn't matter. And that's where the number one, when in doubt, ask comes in. There's not a person that you'll meet that isn't willing to give you some input, advice, or just help. And that's one of the really great things about being there. Uh, and kind of like this phone call, there are lots of people that have input on what you need to know. Number two says never go out with a camera. Yes, I did take over 2,500 pictures, all digital, plus some video. And even if, you know, just keep a little pocket point and shoot because you just never know 
when something is going to pop up that you want to be able to take a picture of. <clears throat> Flexibility is absolutely critical. The I had a virtually flawless trip down there from Charlotte, North Carolina through LA to Sydney to Christchurch. And it was about 26 hours total travel time. Now that included layovers and things. Uh, and so, you know, it, it went well. I heard from some other people that especially had trouble, uh, for the most part, it was getting out of Christchurch because of weather in McMurdo for the uh, ice flight. But I happened to be down there on one of the balmiest years they had on record, and so it was just amazingly pleasant down there. The other thing, you'll get lots of opportunities to go places, do things, see things, talk to other people. Don't let any of them go by. Um, one of the great things about being in McMurdo was just about everybody goes through there even if they're not really sticking around. And so you get a great chance to just talk to people, find out what they're doing, find out about the other projects. And when it came down to actually building my journal entries, a lot of the time I used a lot of that information in the journal entries because it really had a lot of interest in it. Sometimes it tied into my project, sometimes it didn't. A, a polar trek project, it still gave my, my audience, my students and people that were following it, some new information about what goes on. So it's great. Uh, one of the things, if you are in McMurdo, on Sunday evenings in the galley, the, the cafeteria, they have science talks. And then other nights of the week, there are Tuesdays or Wednesdays, they also have some informal talks. Those are great. You can learn an amazing amount of information from those talks about all the projects that are going on. Plus you get to meet these people that are, a lot of them have spent their entire professional life working in Antarctica and some of the stories they have are absolutely amazing. Uh, moving on to number five, if you are not getting the direction you need or expect from your PI, just keep asking. Uh, I had to do some of that. and. At the same time, don't be afraid, depending on the nature of your project, to just kind of go do something. Uh, I did some of that too. And a lot of what I did ended up being uh, electrical work, uh, mechanical work, things like that on the equipment as we were trying to get it ready. Uh, you know, like I wired up a 480 volt transformer. I've never done that before, but heck, the wiring diagram was on the cover. So, and it didn't blow up when we plugged it in, so that was good. And then you will get a lot of training in those first couple of days in McMurdo. Uh, you'll get you'll go to Happy Camper School. You'll get environmental training. You've got some online training uh, courses that you should be taking. Take it all seriously. Everybody down there does. There's nobody who just blows it off. So uh, and all of these things are related to your safety. I've had a lot of outdoor experience, but I've never had outdoor experience in a place where the average wind is 40 to 50 miles an hour and temperatures are barely above zero a good part of the year. So uh, that was, I learned a lot of good things. Uh, number seven down there, if you've got a significant other at home, one of the things I did, and I heard this from another Polar Trek alumni, was I. I literally signed and dated a bunch of cards. Now, I didn't have anything quite as critical as birthday, anniversary, or anything like that happening, but uh, if you do, don't screw up. Make sure that you've got something set up for that, to, for somebody to put a card in the mail, send flowers, whatever, uh, from home. It's a lot easier if you have somebody in the hometown doing it than if you try to do that from McMurdo, even though uh, when you're in McMurdo, it's not that much different than being in virtually any other U.S. city. <clears throat> uh, oh, there's the Sunday and weekday science talk. I forgot to add that in there for number eight. The other thing, if you jump up to number nine, this was kind of different. Uh, one of the things I didn't really understand almost until I got there is that I'm a grantee, and the people who are working, the majority of the people who are in the operations centers and at McMurdo and places are contractors. I mean, I'd heard the term contractor. I didn't really know how it applied. <clears throat> the uh, ASC, the Antarctic support people, are under contract with NSF, and they make up roughly three-quarters of the population of McMurdo. 
the other quarter are the grantees or the science staff. And actually, that was one of the things, for instance, when I was trying to find my uh, PQ documents, and I was calling all the various offices, both in Denver and down in Galveston, I kept getting asked, am I a grantee or a contractor? And it took me a, a couple of times to figure out which one of those I was. Okay? But remember, you're the visitor. Those contractors are in their home, and they're really good hosts. They really want to show you what the place is about, and a lot of them have been there for years. Uh, 15 plus years of time down there in, on the ice, and they know a lot. They may not be the science staff, but they're probably smarter than a lot of them. I didn't say that. Uh, if you're in McMurdo, make sure you take some time to just wander around. Uh, the town is an amazing eclectic collection of just about anything you could ever imagine. There are a bunch of trails around town. Uh, go over and see the pressure ridges that are over by the uh, New Zealand station. You know, again, it's all part of being there, and it's part of what I would say you're expected to do so that you can also give that back to your students as well as just the science. The one thing I found that really, really helped me was I got online with the uh, uh, NSF sites and some other places that I found and just kind of got in my mind what the layout of the station was like, what kinds of things were there, so I didn't walk in totally cold. Kind of like if you're going on a vacation somewhere and you want to learn a little bit about the, the uh, place you're going. There's an awful lot of material online in the, uh, the uh, participant's guide. I haven't looked at the new one that was updated. because when, The one I had was during the transition between the different uh, contract groups. But I'm sure that that will have gobs of information about anything you could want. The, the main thing is you just have to go looking for it. It's probably there. Uh, number 12, that was one that I was a little bit surprised about. Uh, my my project actually got delayed a year, and so I was supposed to go in 2011. I didn't end up going until 2012. During that time, I got a new principal, um, got some new people in the administrative chain, and one of the things that I found out was that the majority of people in the administrative area of my school system were having a really hard time with this because they figured I was just going off on vacation and that I wanted some uh, CEU credits because I happened to be going to somewhere outside the country. They really didn't get it. Uh, nothing I did is covered on standardized tests, so there's a little bit of hesitation about it. Uh, just kind of on the extreme end of that, two days before I was scheduled to literally fly out of Charlotte, they sent me an email saying, oh, by the way, we're giving you your leave of absence, but we're not going to pay you. And this was after all the stuff with Politrek is covering the substitute payments and things like that. And so in the last two days, I was going back through this whole process all over again with the head of our HR department, things like that, telling them why it was that they were going to pay me even though I wasn't present in the state of North Carolina. Okay. I don't know if I ever told Janet that, but that was one of my excitements as I was leaving. So, uh, okay, 13 is kind of like number 9. Get to know those contractors. You're going to have lots of people that you run into that are driving shuttle vans, operating front end loaders, and probably a good percentage of them have a PhD in something, and they're down there because this is something, this is a place they want to be. One of our shuttle drivers, uh, absolute passion was Antarctic exploration, and he was one of the guides to some of the historic huts like Shackleton's Hut and uh, things of that type. And finally, when you're on outreach, uh, I found that my most effective outreach probably was Facebook because it just seemed to be the place that everybody would look at consistently, a lot more so than something like the uh, Polar Trek website or any other school webs, anything like that. Now, I was updating, I was putting in journal entries almost daily because I did have continuous internet access. I was also posting to Facebook and within my own uh, personal school website for my school. The place that I got the most comments tended to be Facebook. Now, I always had it with a link back to the uh, Polar Trek journals, but that was where a lot of the activity came in. The other thing that I found out is that a lot of the uh, 
school systems when it came to the when I had my live event online, I had an amazing number of people who had assured me that they had tested out the links and had the system up and running. You know, when the time came, an awful lot of them never just get connected. So if you have to sit down with somebody in your school and show them how it works to ensure that you get that working, do it. Uh, and again, if you're if you're in uh, McMurdo, don't eat too much. I did. Uh, those are my thoughts. Okay. Um, so um, let's see. We have um, we also have a, a slide here, Mike, that says outreach gear and other hints. Um, do you want to go over that piece? Okay. Uh, well, most of those are pretty straightforward in the outreach. It's make sure you get the classrooms engaged. Uh, the kids really love getting postcards from Antarctica. And I did that simply by telling their teachers if they will get me a, in this case, a lot of them came through uh, my school's inner office mail or school mail, a stack of postcards with a stamp on it with their address, and then I mailed them from Antarctica. That was probably the most popular thing out there. I took Flat Stanley's posters, banners, all that stuff, took pictures, posted those online. They liked that. Um, the other thing is that one that says convey excitement and wonder, even be silly. That's that's one of the things that really attracts their attention. You know, do something goofy. Uh, if you can stand on your head in a snowbank, do it. I can't, but they'd love it. Um, and make sure that when you have people that you're talking to and you tell stories about them that you get their names right and what they've done and where they are because they're looking at these journals too. These are the, the contractors and the people in Antarctica. Once they figure out that what you're down there for, they want to see what you're up to. And if you notice up on the top right corner of the slide is the wizard logo. Uh, we had stickers with that on it. And if somebody in your group has done that and gotten stickers, always have some of those with you. They love stickers, the van drivers, the whoever. In fact, the Delta, one of those transport vehicles, is just loaded with stickers, so you've got to add your own to it. Um, those are always good. Make sure the classrooms, like I said, set up and try the software for live events. The other thing that you check six times before you leave is that you have all the computer cables, camera cables, all that stuff that you could possibly want. And especially take a stack of blank, probably DVDs, for backing up your photos, recording, whatever it is you want. Uh, they're not available down there, and they're easy to pack. There is a great computer support group, but there's no guarantee that they will have every single style of connector that you might possibly want. Uh, I love wool. Wool is wonderful. Uh, I took a full complement of smart wool with me, which is great. It doesn't itch. Like I said, it was really warm when I was there. And a lot of the time I was just wearing a light uh, wool top <clears throat> with nothing else on over that. Other times I had my big red on, but uh, you know, make sure you've got the flexibility in what you're wearing. The other thing that my PI told me right at the end as we were about to leave was, oh, by the way, you ought to have some really good waterproof gloves with you. And this was like a week before I was leaving, so all of a sudden I was looking around for those. Check with them and you know, really beat them up a little bit about, is there anything that I need that they're not going to issue me in Christchurch because they don't have waterproof gloves in Christchurch? In this, in this case, it was sort of heavy, warm, and waterproof because I was gonna, theoretically could have been working with drilling equipment that was had running water in it. Uh, make sure you take a water bottle. As noted, you've got to keep drinking, uh, just you know, an algae or two. They're not necessarily available there. And some of them may have been used for pee bottles, which you probably won't really want to trust the way they got cleaned afterwards. Uh, you definitely need some more or less regular hiking boots or light hikers of some sort, because there, there will probably be times when you don't want to be wearing the issue boots that are huge and hot on both the airplane and in a dorm in McMurdo and in a tent, your plugs and eye shades to block the lighter grate because you will be down there when it's 24 hours of daylight. Um, okay, there's the track to PQ that I noted earlier. Mine got lost in the windfly stuff. 
And since I was leaving the uh, first of November, one of the things that my wife was quite insistent about was that I put the Christmas tree up before I left, and I did. It's in my journal, and uh, that was that probably kept the peace better than everything that I could have done. Uh, anyway, that's I think that was all I had. But any questions on any of that? Yes. That's a, a good uh, break point here. So um, we have uh, Glenn on the phone. Glenn, do you have any questions so far? I'm good so far. You guys are doing a good job. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a you question. Okay. Obed, go ahead. You got a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, actually, a couple of questions. Uh, okay. Number one is regarding um, web tests. Uh, uh, what is your advice? Should I save my webcast to do it from Christchurch? Uh, because I know the issue of bandwidth at the South Pole. Or should I do it at McMurdo? I'm, I'm heading to McMurdo and then to the South Pole. So should I plan my webcast from the pole at McMurdo? I think is there bandwidth better there? And the second question is, uh, if you could answer is regarding altitude, what should I it tips for me to get used to the altitude? I know there is like we're gonna be flying over mountain ranges and and what would be your advice regarding that if you have if you can give it to Well me. I know that in my case the uh the the connectivity at McMurdo is excellent. I would say probably when you get to the South Pole you may have to just check and see what time the satellite goes over that they got internet and how that would uh, mesh with time zones in the U.S. that you want to talk to, that you want the right people to be on. Uh, and otherwise, this, you may need to leave it until later. Yeah, this is Elaine and Obed. I will communicate with you directly regarding altitude and the webcast. I I do a lot of work with the outreach from South Pole, so I'll give you some specific advice on that. Later on, great, okay. Great. Yes, great. I met uh, for the record. I met my CI, Dr. Maston. Actually, we've been hanging out pretty much uh, ever since. He visited my class in March. In May, I'm sorry, I went to Wisconsin uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we, uh, I agree that uh, yeah, you should uh, establish a good uh, relation with your PI, so all questions can be, you know, as many questions as possible can be. Answer on that end. So I had I had a successful so far a good relationship with my PI, and we've been actually hanging out. So we that was cool. Yeah, this is Janet. The other thing about webcast, whether you do it at McMurdo or you do it at South Pole, um, as Mike relayed, McMurdo, you don't have to worry about um, the timing of the satellite as much as you know you do at the South Pole station, and access is a little bit connectivity is different. But um, but the other thing is that the Ice Cube project also has a um, a PR person, and um, Megan will will be scheduling just like she did last year. She will probably end up scheduling your webcast and working directly with you on on when those will happen. Um, that's what they did last year, and and Elaine and we can all talk to you separately about how it works down there in South Pole. But basically, you only have the satellite at certain times a day. And uh, that's when you can do the webcast. So that's kind of what you have to deal with. But Megan and the team from Ice Cube will have, um, as they get closer, and we do the pre-field. They, they will, um, they will, you know, they'll talk about that and how they set those up. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike. Is there um, any? Uh, Yamini had to go. I don't know. If, um, Yamini, uh, do you want to say anything before you sign off here? No, I'm still here. Just um, I'm I'm gonna jump off now. But thank you all, and I'll check in on the archive recording for what I miss and contact you guys if I have other questions. Bye, Amini. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Amini. Bye. 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 Thank you for joining. Okay, um, we're going to go on to uh, Nell's presentation here and her tips for success. So um, we'll uh, turn it over to you, Nell. 
Great. Um, so I have just really a bunch of pictures here and not uh, really any text, but I can kind of go through and talk about most of them and sort of share with you what I did in terms of outreach, um, which was really successful. I was really pleased and continue to be pleased with how it's going with the students who I've put together at my high school. So when I did my Polar Trek expedition, uh, my role at the high school was the gifted teacher. And so even though my background is in biology and science, I, I do a little bit of everything. And so I was trying to figure out how I could incorporate my Polar Trek experience into my high school and into my work with my students in a way that would be meaningful. And what I ended up deciding to do was to develop a club at the school called the Polar Ambassadors. And we would actually meet after school rather than during the school day. Um, so these were kids in grades 9 through 12, and they chose to be part of the group. Most of them had a strong interest in science. Some of them want to be teachers, so some of them have um, you know, maybe a little bit less of an interest in science and more of an interest in um, communicating and, and working with kids. And so what I did with this group of kids was before I left for my experience, we had a number of meetings and we designed t-shirts and we sort of did a lot of team building kinds of activities and some background research about Palmer Station where I was going to go and some background research about ocean acidification, which is the, the project that I was involved with. The, the focus of it was um, ocean acidification. So we did that and um, the kids actually designed t-shirts. The girl who's the second from the right there with the dark hair is the young lady who designed these t-shirts um, for the group. And so before I left, we had, I'd say, gosh, that's hard for me to remember now, but maybe a half dozen after school meetings. And we did a little bit of outreach before I left. We ended up teaching some seventh and eighth grade science classes in my district uh, lessons about ocean acidification that the kids and I developed. So we did some sort of um, laying the, the groundwork before I left and before I took off for Palmer Station I had a party for the kids and you know got them a cake and tried to make them feel really important and really special and that seemed to help a lot with the buy-in. Um, these little guys, the flat penguins over on the right, are something that a third grade class made for the Polar Ambassadors before my expedition. So I took those with me and um, had, you know, kids in all different grade levels from the district following my journals, which was pretty exciting for me. Um, so yeah, we could go to the next picture now. So yeah, that's just me at the airport in Atlanta on my way down to Punta Arenas before I, I got to Palmer Station. And so that was sort of my first picture with some of the flat penguins. and. The third graders who were following along were really delighted to, to see those. And I ended up um, bringing them back to the kids after, after my expedition and visiting their classroom. And I'd had some of the scientists sign the backs of them. So the kids thought that was really great. And, and that was exciting for them, too. So the next one. So these are just um, some of the things that I've done with the Polar Ambassador kids since I've come home. And I've honestly, I've been really amazed at the number of opportunities that have presented themselves. And I feel really, really fortunate. But I think part of it goes back to that whole idea that Mike <laughs> expressed about just pretty much saying yes to everything. If, you, <laughs> if you're physically capable of taking advantage of these experiences, you know, I, I just would recommend to never say no. Um, one of the scientists who I met at Palmer Station is at Rutgers University in New Jersey and invited me and my students to um, come visit the Are You Cool Lab and see the um, autonomous underwater vehicles there. So you can see a couple of these pictures on the left, the top and bottom. We actually got to see sort of the headquarters um, at Rutgers where they program the AUVs and where they keep a lot of the data and analyze a lot of the data. And we got to talk to engineers and people who, who design the AUVs. So it was really, really exciting for my students and also for me. And, you know, they went there with some prior knowledge about Palmer Station. And I had written a journal about all of this and, you know, how these, how these um, AUVs are used at Palmer Station to study phytoplankton diversity and abundance and water chemistry and so on. So my students went there with some prior knowledge, which really helped in terms of asking um, 
important questions and sort of being interested and understanding, oh, Janet, that's cool about the AUV versus ROV. So I'll actually talk about ROVs in, in just a minute here. Um, but another thing that I've um, been really excited about doing with my students since I've gotten home is kind of tying into local festivals in my hometown of State College, Pennsylvania. So, you know, really with a lot of these topics and with polar sciences, you can pretty much make a connection to anything that's based, you know, around the idea of sustainability. So there have been some sustainability festivals in State College where they're kind of focusing on green building and, you know, being environmentally responsible and so on. So I, when I find out about these things, I usually just try to contact the person who is coordinating it and see if my students can come and participate. And, you know, usually folks are delighted to have high school students from the community come and talk about something they're excited about. So that's what that upper right hand photo is. Um, and then the bottom right hand photo is a picture of some of the polar ambassadors at one of the local middle schools. And I've been really excited because I've been able to stay connected to Palmer Station through their education and outreach coordinator, Beth Simmons. Um, who has asked me to help her kind of test out some lesson plans that she's written and then to help her write some curriculum. Um, so that's been another way to kind of keep the Polar Ambassadors going, even though I've been home from my expedition now for a year and a half. Um, so, you know, it just seems like it snowballs and one opportunity leads to another and another and the more kind of connections you make with people, the more invitations you get to do things. and you know, the more opportunities then you can provide for your students, which is really awesome. Um, yeah, I think we could go to the next one. So the left-hand picture is a, a middle school student. Um, and the, the model of the older kids teaching and mentoring the younger kids has worked so well for me. And I, I've been so proud of my students, you know, at the risk of getting a little choked up here. I just have been so proud of them and so inspired by how excited they've become about polar science and, and how eager they are to share what they know with people. Um, so this kid here is actually participating in an activity that um, the polar ambassadors were leading about um, traveling to the Western Antarctic Peninsula and lo the logistics and the complications of it and kind of the history of it and who's been there and how they got there and so on. Um, and that was a really, really fun, fun day, fun activity, great success. Um, the picture on the right was another really exciting opportunity that um, was through Penn State University. So the town where I have been teaching high school is um, in central Pennsylvania and it's where Penn State is located. And there are actually a lot of scientists who um, do work in either the Arctic or the Antarctic there including Richard Alley and, you know, some others who you probably know of. Um, but Penn State has recently formed this um, organization called the Polar Center. And if you're interested, you should definitely check out their website because it's, it's still kind of in the latent, you know, early phases, but uh, nascent phases, I guess. But, but it's um, a pretty neat effort to get scientists to do research in the polar regions to kind of collaborate and talk about what they're doing across departments from, you know, physics to biology to geology and so on because the way Penn State is, it's a, a huge university and people are kind of compartmentalized. So the idea is to try to get some more collaboration happening and then my role with the whole thing is to sort of help with the education and outreach component and the Polar Ambassador kids have been a huge part of that. So this was actually at a, an event to sort of kick off the Polar Center. It was called Polar Day, and it happened last April. And so these were my high school students actually judging posters that graduate students had done. Um, and the grad students, you know, do their research in either the Arctic or the Antarctic region. So this was a really neat opportunity for, for my students to actually kind of see and evaluate real science that's being done by grad students. Um, so. Yeah, that was just uh, a, another really neat opportunity for exposure. Um, so yeah, next next slide. So yeah, these are just some more photos of the Polar Ambassador kids doing outreach. In this case, this was to seventh grade science classrooms in my district. So I, I honestly, I've kind of lost track at this point uh, as to how much outreach we've done. But gosh, I mean, I would say we've probably done outreach to well over, probably well over 1,200 people. Um, and that's kids in our own district, K through 12. 
um, that's in our community, that's in retirement homes, that's, you know, at the university. So really all over the place. Um, and another thing I did, I forgot to mention before I left, if you have the opportunity at all for your PI to come to your school, it's a really, really good way to build excitement. Um, Chuck Amsler is the man who I worked with at Palmer Station, and he's awesome. He um, is a psychologist, so he studies algae, but he's a an avid diver and he does scuba diving in Antarctica to collect his samples and he came and spoke to my kids and showed them, you know, hundreds of amazing photos and slides and actually ended up talking to about 500 kids at my high school of different ages and ability levels and, it, you know, it just, it just helped with the buy-in and helped making people in my um, school and, you know, district aware of what he was doing and what I would eventually be kind of helping out with. So it was, it was great. Um, yeah, I think we could go on to the next one. So this was just another thing, and I'm happy to share any of these, you know, lesson ideas or any of the stuff if you're at all interested. But, you know, of course, Antarctic krill are a huge part of the food web in the Southern Ocean. So what um, my high school students and I ended up doing after school one day was making um, silk screening with the help of a really awesome art teacher at my high school, silk screening these krill t-shirts and making them for all of the seventh graders who the high school kids were mentoring. So you can see, you know, down in the bottom right hand corner, they were pretty psyched to have these grill t-shirts and it was just another sort of, you know, positive way to get kids interested in Antarctica and, and the science and the research that's happening there. So the next one, I think. And maybe that's it, I don't remember. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so the, the upper picture here is, again, it's just another community festival where, um, you know, always I would help the polar ambassadors kind of figure out what they would say and how they would present information. Um, and, you know, I would help them sort of edit and practice and so on. But I really gave them a lot of ownership in the communication and outreach aspect of sharing this information with people. And, you know, at first, I think the first couple times I was a little bit nervous about how it would go. but they really took so much pride in what they were doing that they just kicked butt and, you know, I, I'm amazed by these kids. It's just been a really cool thing. Um, the bottom picture is actually the day that we launched our little ROV at the swimming pool at our high school. And I was able to get um, a small grant from the Palmer LTER Education and Outreach person who I mentioned before, Beth Simmons, um, and then ended up writing a little lesson plan for her about, about ROVs and using them in, a, in Antarctica. Um, so yeah, um, the kids here are all polar ambassadors and we built this thing and tested it out after school. So that's another really kind of fun, fun connection. And then this um, was just another another really cool thing that, that kind of came serendipitously. The man um, on the right, kind of in the back there, his name is Buzz Scott, and he had worked for the U.S. Antarctic program for years. He's an ROV pilot, and through all of this networking and stuff, I ended up becoming friends with him. He lives here in Maine, and um, he's right now running a small nonprofit called Oceans Wide, which is based out of Newcastle, Maine. And he does school visits to anywhere in the country. So he will bring um, actual ROVs to schools and he'll talk about research in the Southern Ocean and how ROVs are used there and um, do some demonstrations. So that's what was happening here. This was um, at the Polar Day event that I mentioned earlier. He actually came and did a little demo with some ROVs in the swimming pool. Um, and then he brought these survival suits for my students to try on and, you know, play with, which was also great, great fun. So, yeah, he's another really good connection. Um, Oceans Wide is the name of his organization. And like I said, they have a website and he does school visits. So, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, Click on the top button once now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, just, 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 uh,
and also this is for the archive for the Polar Center it is um, HTTP uh, polar .edu. So just so you guys have that. Um, and I think that was a, a good presentation. Is there any questions from Ovid or Glenn about um, outreach activities or things that uh, Mel was talking about? Well, before I ask my question, I I was already able. I'm log, I'm able to log in online on my pad, so I'm gonna just connect on the phone. I guess we can. I can hear you over. So I'm gonna do that. So in case I get disconnected, I just want you to be aware. Well. Okay, sounds great, Ovid. Um, I'm okay so far. I've, I've actually started a lot of those things, uh, setting them up. But thanks a lot. Okay, okay. great. Um. Yeah, so um, in an effort to uh, kind of get going and let you guys all go and stuff, um, we aren't going to go into too much more here. We just wanted to remind everybody um, that there's a lot of things that are required before you actually are deployed to the field that relate to the education outreach planning and uh, program requirements. So just make sure you go back and start refreshing your memory about those and um, get them um, Get, start sending in some drafts and have things that are work that you're working on with your researchers um, before you um, get deployed. Uh, the other thing is that it's a great time to start um, refamiliarizing yourself with uh, the online environment, the Polar Trek website, and journaling. All that good stuff. So you don't have to wait till you're in the field to start journaling about getting ready, what it's like to be back to school. Uh, any outreach activities you're doing, um, that kind of thing, and start getting the word out that uh, you exist virtually. Um, and let's see, uh, just a reminder that if you do start school again soon, um, we will be sending out that link for your students to take the pre-survey um, test as well as we'll, um, it's a quick questionnaire about your class classroom this year. And we'll send out an email about that. Um, I see lots of texting going on, chatting and stuff. So is there anybody that um, has any more feedback or questions or comments? Um, I'll start with Elaine. Anything else you want to add here? I think the presentations were fabulous. And it makes me so excited for these people going down for the first time. It's going to be wonderful. And again, um, we will make sure everybody gets my contact information if they have specific questions that I can help them with. So I'm very excited for everybody. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it was great for you to join us today. Thank you for uh, just doing that, Elaine. Uh, Mike, any last things you want to add or comment on? Well, I just put one comment up there, and that was when Nell was talking made me think of this. Um, when I came back from my expedition, it was right after Christmas, and our semesters changed roughly the second week of January. So I pretty much came back to, to review my class to get them ready for finals and really didn't have time to go over what I had done with any great amount of time. So if that happens to you just in terms of timing, uh, look for ways to work around that or to find some way to, to really work with your students on that. I just Timing is everything, and it just wasn't very good online. Good, good point. Yeah, I, I recommend uh, starting. You know, as soon as you go into your classroom, uh, getting them used to things as soon as you can. Uh, now, anything you want to add? So, just you know, everybody have a great experience, and I'll be excited to follow along and and see what everybody's doing. And it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. Obed, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Obed. Are you there, Obed? Click on the, maybe through the tablet. I don't know if you have a talk button. Click on the talk button. Okay. You're typing. All right. Well, we'll wait for you to type there. Um, and uh, Glenn, anything else from you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you hear me? Obed. Can you hear uh, me? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Obed. Yes. Can you hear me? 
Okay, yeah. This is a, a you yes. mentioned earlier about an issue when uh, as a teacher had to request a um, uh, a little bit. I had to do that because uh, my principal and the school district was they were very adamant about giving me a leave uh, or a sabbatical. So I had to take an unpaid leave. So any more uh, comments regarding that? I mean, my my concern. I mean, was a parallel to what he said that uh, uh, the, 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 I had to actually take a uh, leave of absence in order for me to go on my expedition in January. So, any thoughts on that? Any comments or advice? Uh, uh, this is uh, this is Janet Obed. Yeah, let's talk uh, offline about that some more. And why don't you email us the specifics so that we can. Um, Help you with that. Did you hear that a bit? Uh, maybe not. Um, yeah, I'm typing you a message, COVID. Okay, so. Um, Anyway, I think we'll uh, sign off here. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, thank you, Nell and Mike, for joining us today and sharing everything. And like I said at the beginning, this is archived, and uh, we'll send out the archive to everybody. And uh, Elaine and Sarah and I are happy to help you in um, in your process. And we look forward to uh, also following you on your adventure and talking with you real soon on pre-field calls. So with that, everybody have a good night, good afternoon, wherever you are, and um, good best of luck with your uh, school years coming up. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Great to hear your voice. Bye-bye.